I want you to hit me as hard as you can. He plays with the genres of sci-fi and sex like a warrior poet ready for battle. Director Paul Verhoeven has brought us some of the most groundbreaking, thought-provoking films of all time. The man is just on a mission to share his truth. And sometimes it's easier to get the truth out there through science fiction allegories than to just straight out say it. Plus it's more fun. And that's what Paul Verhoeven does best. You see, Verhoeven is many things to many people. To some, he's just a Hollywood hotshot who makes bloody and sexy schlock. And to others, he's a master storyteller who always has something to say about us as human beings and where we are and where we're going. And to others, he's just a crazy man who made showgirls. He's a very mysterious artist, and it's hard to predict what he's going to do next. Is he working on a new sci-fi extravaganza? Is he taking it easy in his old age? Or did he leave and go to Mars? I will try my best to answer most of those questions and more, as we try to find out what the f happened to Paul Verhoeven. And you can keep your undergarments on for this one. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> But to truly understand what the f happened to Paul Verhoeven, we must start at the beginning. And the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1938, Amsterdam. And according to every history book I've ever read, that was a very interesting place and time to grow up. Young Paul came of age amongst the rubble and debris of World War II, constantly surrounded by the horrors of war. And to me, this explains a lot about his social commentary and, and violence in his filmography. In interviews, Verhoeven has said that his memories of this time are images of violence, burning houses, dead bodies in the street, and just being in continuous danger. Yet, due to his young age, he saw the war as an exciting adventure. Then, after the war, they got to go back to movie theaters again and watch American films. Paul Verhoeven saw the 1953 version of War of the Worlds ten times in theaters. As he grew up, Verhoeven studied hard in the world of academia and graduated with degrees in mathematics and physics. But he said, f**k all that, I want to make movies. He then made a film called Business is Business in 1971 about prostitutes in Amsterdam. So he was into making highly sexualized films from very early on. And the film, Business is Business, would go on to become one of the most popular films ever in the Netherlands, outselling tickets for both Gone with the Wind and The Sound of Music. Wow! Verhoeven would then reunite with Rutger Hauer and team up with fellow Dutch cinematographer Jean de Bon for the romantic drama Turkish Delight in 1973, which was the most successful film in the history of Dutch cinema at the time. Records show that 3.5 million tickets were sold for this film, which was 26% of the population of the Netherlands at that time. Anybody who was anybody was watching Turkish Delight. It was nominated for Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards. So yeah, Paul Verhoeven was just hitting them right out of the park from very early on. Wow. He would then follow up Turkish Delight with a film called Katie Tipple. It was the number one film of the Netherlands that year. But Verhoeven says that this is the only film that he wishes he would go back and remake. He has some cinematic regrets about this one. Then, in 1977 came a film called Soldier of Orange. Rutger Hauer and Paul Verhoeven would reunite for this film about the German occupation of the Netherlands during World War II, something that Verhoeven was quite familiar with. The film would win Best Foreign Language Film at the Los Angeles Critics Association and would be nominated for the same award at the Golden Globes, if you care about the Golden Globes. At that time, it was ranked the second best 
Dutch film ever made just behind Paul Verhoeven's own Turkish Delight. So yeah, right away he just made like the best Dutch films ever. Adieu, my kleine Next, Verhoeven would make Spetters, which is often called the Dutch Saturday Night Fever. The original script was rejected by the Dutch Movie Foundation for being too vulgar, so Verhoeven rewrote the script and resubmitted it. Then when that script received funding, Verhoeven threw away the rewrite and just went back to his original extra naughty version. At the time, American filmmakers were starting to notice Paul Verhoeven and he was even being considered to direct Empire Strikes Back. But apparently, because of this movie, George Lucas changed his mind. The very negative reaction to this film by the Netherlands took its toll on Verhoeven, who then decided to begin seeking out opportunities in the American film market. But before he would make that move, he would make a horror movie. 1983 called The Fourth Man, and the film was a box office hit becoming the highest grossing Dutch film in the United States. The film was nominated for several prestigious awards, including Best Foreign Language Film for the National Board of Review of Motion Pictures. Verhoeven would then reunite with Rutger Hauer to make his English language debut in the film Flesh and Blood. And during this production, he would clash with Rutger on set, and unfortunately, this would be the last time they ever worked together. But they did rekindle their friendship years later. Bless you, Mark. Your award's in heaven. I'd rather get paid sooner, sir, if you don't mind. This film really tested Paul Verhoeven, who said that it almost made him quit directing due to all of the issues during production. This movie was not fun to make, and if you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. But the film was unsuccessful in North America, officially prompting Verhoeven to move over to the United States of America and better try to understand American culture to make more financially successful films. And that decision really paid off because his next movie was the highly successful, groundbreaking, milestone, greatest thing ever, Robocop, in 1987. <laughs> the project had gone through many directors, including David Cronenberg, but nobody truly understood what the script was trying to do. Even Paul Verhoeven just read a few pages and threw it in the trash. So we can credit Paul Verhoeven's wife who actually read the entire script and convinced Verhoeven to do the film, saying that the more you read, the more the story offers deeper satirical meanings of American life and the lack of identity and the human condition and what it means to be alive and, and family and, and violence and there's, and, and, and there's just so much in this movie. It is full of wonderful religious symbolism. Paul Verhoeven saw Robocop as like the ultimate American Jesus figure because he was he was killed and then he was he was resurrected to save mankind. And there's even a subtle, not so subtle shot of Robocop walking on water. I mean, it's just a shallow puddle, I guess, but he, he's walking on it, and, and that, that means Jesus symbolism. This, this film is probably blasphemous, but, it, but it's the fun kind of blasphemy. And they say Jesus had a sense of humor, so I'm, I'm sure he would totally be cool with it. Maybe not. I don't know. That are alive, you are coming with me. Paul Verhoeven is really, really great at world building. And in Robocop, you can really feel like you're thrown into this fully lived-in dystopia. The audience instantly feels like they're part of this society. And this is done not through just stupid narration or exposition, it, it's done through their television, with news and, and commercials and, and even TV shows that fuel the culture of this Verhovenized world. So your mind totally gets into the Robocop state which is, is just, it's just perfect. Robocop was originally rated X, 
and had to be submitted eight times to the MPAA to secure an R rating. Your move, creep. Empire Magazine ranked RoboCop as number 404 in their top 500 films of all time, ultimately making $53 million on a $13 million budget. Critics found the film surprisingly smart. They actually got it and found that the ultra-violence was the perfect way to satirize the American business culture and journalism. And the film received an Academy Award for Best Sound Editing. Sound editing is, is important, you guys. And of course, there was a remake in 2014 that we all forgot about. Excuse me, Robo, any special message for all the kids watching at home? Wow. Stay out of trouble. Verhoeven would follow up the success of RoboCop with another sci-fi action film, the Arnold Schwarzenegger starring Total Recall. This is another smart satire disguised as a big dumb action movie. It's so dumb that it's smart. This time the victims of Paul Verhoeven's satirical commentary were colonialism, immigration, and our perception of reality. And just like with RoboCop, Total Recall was originally slapped with an X rating because of its excessive violence. It was just too much red stuff. <laughs> and the best part about this movie is that you never really know what is real and what's not and what's a dream and what's not. It's just, it's just blowing my mind. And this one was a huge blockbuster. Total Recall made $261 million on a $65 million budget. And it even won an Oscar for visual effects. Well deserved. Oh yeah, and they also remade Total Recall in 2012, and I, I, I forgot about that one too. And Arnold and Paul, they really loved working together, and they even developed a film set in the Crusades. I think it was called Crusade. I don't know, I can, I can just imagine it right now and just it's just really cool, but it never got made. There's still time. You guys aren't that old to go on one last crusade. Come on. Verhoeven would return to his sultry ways with the steamy 1992 thriller, Basic Instinct. And since Paul Verhoeven had dealt with the MPAA several times before, he knew that this film had a high chance of being highly censored. So he shot every sex scene from pretty much every angle and distance you can imagine, just in case. And we have to mention the famous leg crossing scene. According to Sharon Stone, Paul Verhoeven asked her to remove her underwear because they were too bright on camera. And Sharon didn't really know that the cameras were gonna pick up everything. And when she saw the film at the premiere, she was mortified. However, she did eventually allow the scene to remain because Paul was able to convince her that it was true to her character. He was like, your character would never wear underwear. And she was like, you're right. Basic Instinct originally got an NC-17, but they cut out 47 seconds of it, and now it's R. But it's one of those films with mixed reviews. Many people loved it, praising the Hitchcockianness of it, and how it empowered all the ladies, I guess. But others called the film just a, a porno and said it had no depth. And yeah, it's one of those movies that gets nominated for Oscars and Razzies, with Oscar nominations for Best Film Editing and Original Score, and Razzie nominations for all the actors. But Paul Verhoeven laughed all the way to the bank, because this movie made $353 million on a $49 million budget. Then came the year 1995, and we now arrive at the most notorious flop in film history. Showgirls. Well, one of the most notorious flops in film history. There's a lot of flops out there flopping around. The idea for Showgirls came when Verhoeven decided that he wanted to make a big MGM-style musical set in Las Vegas. 
but over time the musical element was dropped and it, and it just became Showgirls. But it, funny enough, Showgirls would later become a Broadway musical. So yeah, several big names were approached to star in Showgirls, like Angelina Jolie, Drew Barrymore, Denise Richards, and Pamela Anderson, but they all turned it down. So they went with the logical choice, the girl from Saved by the Bell. But Showgirls was received so poorly that Elizabeth Berkley's agents dropped her after it was released. That's a little harsh, you guys. Kyle McLaughlin's in this one, and he says he took on the role just because he wanted to work with the guy who made RoboCop. And it was rumored that Kyle McLaughlin walked out of the premiere. You got too much talent for it to be right. Get out of here! Bitch, I'm telling you the truth! But some people don't hate this movie. There's some people that love it. One guy loves it so much that he wrote a book about how Showgirls doesn't suck, and he called it It Doesn't Suck, and laid out his case of how this film is a masterpiece, and it's misunderstood, and, and maybe it is. Uh, a lot of Paul Verhoeven's films are misunderstood. Um, I'm just better at understanding RoboCop. But this time, unlike his other films, the studio actually wanted an NC-17 rating. Verhoeven has expressed sincere regret over what the movie did to Elizabeth Berkley's career, saying that she is a phenomenal actress and she did everything he asked her to do, and that the failings of this movie and her performance are solely on Paul's shoulders. He takes full responsibility. And throughout it all, Berkeley has remained a good sport. She even made a joke about it on a Saved by the Bell reunion on one of those shows with, with one of the Jimmys. Uh, tell me about it, Slater. I mean, Jimmy going on a date with Nicole Kidman uh, is like Jesse becoming a stripper. Uh, <laughs> Showgirls cost $45 million to make and only managed to make back 20 and was deemed a massive financial failure even though it remains the highest grossing NC-17 ever. However, the film has gained a massive following on home video, pulling in over $100 million in video rentals. Everyone thinks of Showgirls as this big flop, but, but these Showgirls actually aren't flopping around. Showgirls became the biggest winner at the Razzies, ever winning seven awards until Adam Sandler made that Jack and Jill movie, which beat it. It won 10. But for a long time, Showgirls held on to that Razzie title. And there's even a term out there that I'm sure you've heard. It's, it's called Showgirls Bad. It's a term that many movie nerds use when they're referencing a film that's so bad that it's actually good. Awfully good. But there were many critics at the time that called this movie vile and misogynistic. But that's kind of the point of the movie, and, and many critics had to admit that. <laughs> then in 1997, Paul Verhoeven gifted the world the film Starship Troopers. It's another great misunderstood sci-fi satire classic. Nominated for Best Special Effects that still mostly hold up today. Mostly. It's a spiritual and tonal companion piece to RoboCop and Total Recall. In Starship Troopers, it's, it's one hell of a movie. It's, it's, it's pretty much why we fight or triumph of the will, but with big bugs in space. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part too. <laughs> And I have gone through many stages with this film. At first, when I was a kid in good old 1997, this was just an awesome looking rated R movie that I wasn't allowed to watch. Then, when I finally got a chance to see it, Starship Troopers was just an awesome, big, dumb action movie, which I loved. Then, I watched it again when I had a few more candles on my cake, and now I see the film as brilliant. It is such a smart satire of war propaganda and the military-industrial complex. And once again, he's using silly science fiction to make a point about society, 
and the human condition, in love, in pain, in the media, in friendship, in fascism, just like RoboCop. This right here is what Polly V is best at, making a beautiful work of art disguised as cheesy schlock. It's like hiding the Mona Lisa in a tub of nacho cheese. Kinda nasty, but kinda delicious, and at the center is just like the most beautiful thing ever. Watching Starship Troopers is such an amazing experience because you get to experience it multiple times, multiple points of views from, from multiple life stages. It just gets better with age, as I age and the film ages. It's like a, like a fine cinematic wine. But this time, Francis Ford Coppola didn't make it. Paul Verhoeven did. The controversial co-ed shower scene, which featured lots of the cast, male and, and women, nude, was only done after Paul Verhoeven agreed to direct the scene naked himself. Because apparently being naked directed by a naked man is is easier. But it was like, do, do you guys really think that Paul Verhoeven had, had a hard time taking off his clothes? I mean, he is Dutch. Just saying. Verhoeven has always clashed with uh, how Americans see nudity. He, he, he sees their American stance on nudity in movies very strange, and many people agree with him. And he said that it's harder to get a naked body past the censors than it is a body riddled with bullets. The film is based off the 1959 novel of the same name, but Paul Verhoeven admits that he never finished reading it. But of course, you know, Paul just wanted to do his own thing and make statements about the military and government control and, you know, war in general. Because remember, he grew up in, in a war. Would you like to know more? When the film was released, it received mixed reviews, with most calling it a, a fun movie with horrible acting. But of course, many people didn't get it. The film would pull in $121 million on a budget of $105 million. So, Starship Troopers was looked at as a financial disaster. Yet, even with those numbers, the film has spawned an entire franchise, with four direct-to-video sequels, comics, video games, and even an animated TV series. But who cares about all those? Paul Verhoeven said that Starship Troopers is his favorite movie he's ever directed. Verhoeven said that his intention with Starship Troopers was to make 90210 in space. He wanted everyone in the cast to resemble a proto-fascist ideal. And the acting in the movie was probably my biggest concern about it at first, when I was young and dumb, and I didn't get it. Then I watched it again and it's totally obvious that these bad performances are on purpose. They really help push the film's message. It's freaking brilliant. Paul Verhoeven was, like, he was dedicated to, to what he wanted out of this film, and he got it. Only Paul Verhoeven could make such a powerful statement with such crappy acting from such unlikable characters. Once again, this movie is so dumb, it's smart, if that makes sense. He also went on the record that this movie was always intended to be a satire, saying that basically the political undercurrent of the film is that these heroes are living in a fascist utopia, and they aren't even aware of it. That's, that's the point. And I love how Starship Troopers' story is structured, and how it mostly plays out through this world's mainstream media and propaganda making it feel like you are there experiencing these events the way that the characters would if they were watching TV. Like Robocop! And much like his other notorious bomb, Showgirls, Starship Troopers has gained a cult following. And like I said, as the years go by, the appreciation for this film grows. And it is finally getting the recognition that it deserves as an excellent piece of American cultural satire or parody.
What's the, what's the satire and what's the parody? Then came the new millennium with a new film called Hollow Man, which was nominated for uh, Best Special Effects, but got pretty lackluster reviews from the critics saying that the visual effects were impressive, but the story ultimately developed into just a typical horror movie. And after the release of the pretty decent Invisible Man film, Hollow Man seems even more hollow than ever. And I actually kind of like Hollow Man. And the film did pull off a decent profit with $190 million worldwide off a $95 million budget, but wasn't enough money to, to make a difference. But Polly V still did his work and did his job on this one. He shot the film in chronological order to help the actors' performances develop better as the story goes along. And the film spent over 50 million on special effects. And they're, they're, they're good, they're pretty good, yeah. And surprisingly enough, Hollow Man did not get an X or an NC-17. This one was actually awarded the R. Even though you get to see Kevin Bacon's skinless bacon. I don't know, that, that, that part always disturbed me. It's like a bacon basic instinct moment, but with less skin. Paul Verhoeven would later go on to say that he was very dissatisfied with Hollow Man, saying that it was the first movie that he made that he felt that anybody could have made. And this, this Hollow Man, this, this invisible Kevin Bacon monster officially turned Paul Verhoeven off of making big Hollywood studio movies, which maybe was a good thing. It would be six years before Paul Verhoeven would release his next film, this time leaving the sci-fi element behind to return to World War II with the film Black Book. I remember seeing the trailer to this film and thinking, what? This is a Verhoeven film? Where are all the robots and the aliens and the, the naked people? But that's what Paul Verhoeven does. He, he always gives you something surprising. You never know what he's gonna do, and that's what makes him Paul. This film would mark his first return to writing and shooting in the Netherlands in over 20 years. Black Book was the most expensive Dutch production ever, over 20 million in US dollars, and it turned out to be the Netherlands' most commercially successful film. And in 2008, the Dutch public voted this film right here, Black Book, the best Dutch film ever made. And Black Book was also nominated for the Golden Lion at the Venice International Film Festival. If you care about the Venice International Film Festival, critics praised the film for not shying away from the raw violence of war, which Paul knows all too well. Then Paul stepped aside from movies for a bit and decided to enter the world of literature. He wrote a book about Jesus. The book was called Jesus of Nazareth. This is Paul Verhoeven's revisionist take on the story of Christ. It's like a Bible reboot. But this time, Paul removes all of the magical spiritual stuff, like the Immaculate Conception, the miracles, and the resurrection. Paul's book just focuses on the ethical teachings of Jesus. And he was working on a movie about Jesus too, and rumor has it Mel Brooks was involved, so that would have been very interesting, but that didn't happen. Yet. Then he participated in something called Tricked, which was basically just the Dutch interpretation of Project Greenlight. <laughs> then in 2016 came the film L. This would be Verhoeven's first feature film since Black Book 10 years earlier, as well as his first French language film. Verhoeven was drawn to the material because it was unlike anything he'd ever done before, and that's such a Verhoeven thing to do. The film won the Golden Globe for the best foreign language film, yet was completely snubbed by the Academy, if you care about the Academy. 
I mean, it wasn't even nominated for Best Foreign Language Film, but it did get a nomination for Best Lead Actress, which is a rare feat for a foreign language film. Polly V's movies, sometimes they're at the Razzies and sometimes they're at the Oscars. Verhoeven said he absolutely loved making the film in France. He even learned French just so that he could communicate with his cast and crew. Learning a language to make a movie, that's, that's impressive. A whole language. And Elle received a full seven minute standing ovation at its premiere at the Cannes Film Festival, where it was nominated for the film's top prize, the Palme d'Or. But it did only manage to pull in $13 million worldwide, but it has still gone down as one of the most respected films of that year, landing on over 30 top 10 lists. It's a long way from Showgirls. Verhoeven's next film, Benedetta, am I saying that right? A French-Dutch collaboration based on the true life story of a 17th century nun who begins to have a love affair with another woman. The film would have its premiere at the 2021 Cannes Film Festival. That's, that's this year that we're, we're currently in. Because the 2020 festival was delayed because they decided to shut the whole f***ing world down, and the movie had already been delayed since 2019 because Paul Verhoeven was recovering from hip surgery. He's 82 after all. So yeah, hip surgery, a pandemic, everything tried to stop this movie from, from getting out there, but it's, it's out there. Paul, you're a true cinematic warrior who doesn't give up and, and keeps fighting, even even at, at your age, wow. <laughs> Paul Verhoeven has made a name for himself, taking on taboo topics that other filmmakers dare not touch. He took his worldview and applied it to American filmmaking to great success, essentially single-handedly reinventing the sci-fi genre giving the world of Hollywood a unique Dutch eye. He made one of the most notorious bad films ever. Then he went on to make one of the most respected foreign language films ever. And in between, he made some of the most groundbreaking sci-fi classics ever. He is a filmmaker who continually surprises us. Whether he's making a sexually graphic film about Vegas strippers, or a sexually graphic film about alien bugs. He's always delivering the goods. Older there, and I was hoovering there. He's talking, he's talking, he's talking, talking, talking till he spit, drift, and goes up and strikes! His films are often called exploitative, misogynistic, and downright over the top and yet that criticism never deters him. His output has definitely slowed in the last couple decades after his noteworthy exit from Holly Weird, but he is a true mother artist and nobody, not nobody can take that away from Mr. Paul. And just recently, like really, really recently, Verhoeven gave an interview where he said that he was working on a political spy thriller set in Washington, D.C. It will be a modern take on politics, just like how Robocop was his take on the Reagan era. So I cannot wait to see Polly V's political commentary on, on what's going on right now. And even if he doesn't produce another frame of film, that's totally fine too because he has left his violent, sexy, satirical mark on the art of cinema forever. And I am sure that civilizations far into the future will be studying Paul Verhoeven's works. So nobody, not nobody, should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Paul Verhoeven, because he's doing just fine. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night. I'll buy that for a dollar. <laughs> Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. 
We're an independent company, and we appreciate all your support.